Christ Jesus' disciples question him on the signs of the end of the age. And this word of warning that Christ Jesus delivers to the faithful followers is found also in St. Matthew's Gospel and in St. Mark's Gospels. Wars, catastrophes, pestilence, famine, earthquake, signs in the heavens. Now these gospel passages often trigger commonly held views about the ultimate future of the world, the end of the age. However, these views very, very often, more often than not, distort the meaning of the gospel. For example, when speculating on the end of the world, the big screen and the small screen and books, even some Christians instigate and cultivate fear of the future. And this happens in our collective conscience. But what temptation is lurking in this harmful and anxiety inducing fear of the apocalypse? There's many, many movies out there, many, many movies out there, books out there, fear of the apocalypse. Well, there is a temptation that is there. And those with eyes to see and ears to hear will be able to pick up on it especially if you read the Gospels and actually read what's there. And the goal is subtle. The goal is to distract even the elect, if possible, from the reality of God's love. How is this possible? Well, I hope that we can unpack a bit of that this morning. The faithful and true church is called to pay close attention to the Gospel. And the emphasis of Christ's words of warning, they aren't focused on fear mongering. They're not focused on any great special effects. And Christ Jesus by no means wants to sow fear in his disciples. On the contrary, he says, do not be terrified for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. He is making clear the reality of the times of trial that will lead to his second advent, his return in glory and power. And Jesus is reinforcing here his word, do not fear, for I have overcome the world. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. So what he's saying is no external strife or tribulation or anything or anyone instead of Christ will be able to shake the patient, faithful, and true church. No one, no thing, no occurrence will shut down that hungering and thirsting for righteousness in the soul of the faithful church. No worldly powers will restrict repentance or steadfastly practicing the virtues by the grace of God. Not even a hair of one's head can be eternally destroyed by the prideful and foolish of the evil one. And those that freely choose to follow and to fawn over the father of lies and his chosen ones. Well, the first reality that Christ reveals in the face of such conditions and chaos worldwide is the gospel. Those that seek first the kingdom of God will preach the gospel in all the world. And he says, this will give you an opportunity to testify. And I'm sure that his followers were thinking, as we might be, how in the world am I ever going to survive this? Is it even possible? But Christ Jesus is clear. He's saying, yes, you will live. And yes, you will teach and preach everywhere that I call you to go. And I will care for you. I will give you my courage. I will give you my courage to continue. I will not desert you. I will not forsake you. I will love you faithfully and fully to the end of your life. 
whether it's in this age or in the age to come, doesn't matter. Well, this is opposite to the pop culture versions of the apocalypse, the end of the world. And the faithful and true church must be fully aware of this. Why is that? Because it's unacceptable for one who trusts God. It's inappropriate for one who seeks to live with, to live in communion, in union with God. It's unacceptable to yield to the terror of the future. Yes, we may be shaking in our boots, but we use the words of Christ before the cross. Nevertheless, your will be done. They don't yield. The church does not yield to any panic, any fear, any undue anxiety. For sadly, this is a sign of pride mixed with self-reliance and not loving concern for others and their salvation, nor is it concern for our salvation for that matter. <clears throat> Did I get the right prepping done? Did I real, build the correct bunker under the ground to survive this, this, and this? You see how it becomes a focus on self. The second reality of the gospel, of the time leading to the end of the age, is equally important, if not more so, because it causes the end to come. We need to go to St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. Because of the increase of wickedness and lawlessness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Unfortunately, love growing cold is not understood correctly, but Christ is clear because lawless iniquity abounds. The love of many will grow cold. Now, some interpret love growing cold as some kind of maybe a, a social crisis or upheaval caused by the spread of intolerance they're not being tolerant of me and of my lifestyle, who I say I am. That maybe the people become more and more mean-spirited towards one another. But there is this evil consequence to this way of thinking. Listen closely. This isn't expressed very clearly these days. The consequence is the search for and the implementing of a plan of social welfare that prevents social conflict at any price. The consequence is the search for and the implementing of a plan of social welfare that prevents social conflict at any cost. Now, this no social conflict at any cost comes from a misunderstanding of God's love. There's also with that an undercurrent of concern, of insisting on God's holy values, God's virtues, and God's truth. Why? Because such a a faithful and firm stance might lead to social conflicts. I might rub somebody's feathers the wrong way. People might be offended. What will continue, however, is growing lawlessness as far as obeying Christ's commands, an increase in self-made laws, and a growing tolerance for turning from God, which the church calls sin an increase in soul deep fear and undue anxiety that am we doing the right thing? Did I say the wrong thing? Did I offend somebody? What's going on? I gotta be careful. I gotta watch what I say. I gotta watch what I think. Undue anxiety. And this comes from the reality of an incorrect understanding of the gospel and God's love. 
So how must the faithful and true church understand the words of Christ's love growing cold? Well, the great saints of the church all agree that this mostly has to do with the cooling of love for the truth. The love growing cold for a person, Christ Jesus is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. Many teachers of doctrine will teach and preach much instead of the truth. And these false prophets will bring about such harm they cause even the fervent love for truth, who is a person, to fade. People will even flock to the church and not find consolation for their troubled souls. This means that that simple, steadfast, and obedient childlike faith will be replaced by a, a childish and a disobedient and an anxious faith in false truth, meaning false teaching and preaching of Christ and the gospel, meaning that there will be worldwide plans and policies and social systems that are instead of Christ's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Christ himself, as we have said, directly links this cooling of love to abounding lawlessness and evil. So again, We'll press this pedal. This end of the age cooling of love is not simply a change of the relationships between people. Neither is this love growing cold an increase in hatred, but something much, much worse. Love growing cold is primarily a perversion of the true understanding of love. At least one saint wrote, and I really love his words, he gets to the point. False prophets of the last times, both public and religious leaders, will wrongly interpret this supreme virtue, love, so that the followers of Christ will not be able to rejoice in such a love, knowing that the love espoused is not the love of God. It is entirely possible that we are talking about a kind of understanding of love, which really leads to the decrease of social pressure to establish a supposed harmonious society without conflicts. This is not love as a divine gift, but rather a mutually satisfactory bargain for the sake of comfort. Everyone must give up firm convictions of what is godly and true and acknowledge the relativity of all values for the sake of social peace and prosperity. This will lead to the perversion of love, God's love. In the name of this corruption will now be called virtue. Inequity will increase. Christ Jesus is saying as a clear sign that this is the fact that humankind sets forth themselves on a path that leads to destruction, for they have exchanged the love who is God for love as defined by themselves and for themselves. Christ Jesus says concerning wars and cataclysms and calamities and pestilence and floods and famines, do not be terrified. False Christs, antichrists. By the way, antichrist doesn't mean necessarily persecuting the church. Anti means instead of Christ, setting up things and people instead of Christ. Don't be terrified. These things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. He's calling his followers to patience. He's building them up with God's love and faith and courage. He encourages those 
that are faithful not to add or subtract from what Christ delivered to the apostles and those that hold firmly to the truth, those that endure to the end will be saved. Saved means victory, victory over our own sin and brokenness and death. It means healing and wholeness in to the very likeness of God. The eternal one whose Holy Spirit dwells within the faithful and true, the baptized adopted children of God says plainly and with ultimate authority, so make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. That means people that go to seminary and people that wear robes and funny hats that stand at the front don't have the inside track. No, it's those that are faithful, those that endure to the end. Make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. Christ prepares the faithful church with this reality that will be before his return and glory. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. Christ Jesus is enabling the church to discern between hardship that would befall believers for no other reason than their faith in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the adversary never stops deceiving. The adversary never stops resisting in every possible way, using every person to confound, to confuse. Anybody that will listen. And God sees this resistance against us, the church. No. God sees this resistance against himself. Do not fear, Jesus is saying. Go to the battle that is put before you. It is I that put it there. It is I who will fight with you, beside you and within you. You will utter, but it is I that will speak. The faithful church, except from the head of the body of Christ, this word and wisdom, confounding the evil ones and revealing their ultimate weakness before the suffering faithful body of Christ. He is responsible for every hair on one's head and he has promised triumph. Yes, the church will suffer, but the faithful and true church must not be passive for Christ says, by your endurance, you will gain your souls. By your patience, you will possess your soul. What does that mean? Well, as one saint wrote, to possess the soul is by the virtue of patience, because patience is the basis of every righteousness and the protector of righteousness. Patience endures peacefully all evil that befalls us from others without having any ill feelings towards those who drop that evil upon us. The gospel teaches and preaches God's word and truth, not a fear of the end of the age. On the contrary, Christ Jesus encourages the faithful to courage and steadfastness, urging people to stay away from that unconscious focus on somehow resolving all social conflict at all costs and by giving up the truth for a lie. Is the evil one urging people to unconsciously focus on resolving social conflict at all cost? Is the gospel clearly sounding the warning of the danger of love deprived of, deprived of faithfulness, deprived of truth? in exchange for social comfort is the supreme eternal virtue of love, God's love, growing cold, becoming for many 
in reality, the vice of comfort and the vice of ease in the face of the reality placed before them. <laughs>